Okay, so Richard Erskine, thank you for accepting this interview. Uh, I'm excited to do this interview uh, with you. Well, thank you for inviting me to talk with you and your conference people. I wanted to attend the conference, but my schedule would not allow it. So it's a delight to have this time with you. Thank you. So uh, I'm beginning with the uh, first question. You are an authoritative teaching and supervising uh, transactional analyst. During the 60s and the 70s, transactional analysis has represented a great innovation for the psychotherapy world uh, because of the democratic and the equal approach to the patient therapist relationship. Could you tell us something about that and uh, uh, if you consider this contractual and equal approach still innovative today? Innovative, no, but standard practice, yes. Eric Byrne, as far as I can tell, was the first person to really write about contracts. Mm -hmm. And he wrote about it because he found in psychoanalysis there was a hierarchical sense of power where the analyst determined what was happening. Um, and he wanted to make it much more cooperative, a co-constructed therapy relationship. And so he felt the idea of working with the client of what do you want to achieve? Mm -hmm. How do you know you will have changed? How can we measure it? Because I think at the same time, in the late 60s and early 70s, you had the big influence of behavioral therapy. Mm. So there's a lot of focus on measuring the outcome. Mm. So we had two things happening at once. A sense of equality and a sense of trying to prove the therapy was short-term and had positive change. In terms of the innovation, I first read Games People Play in 1965 and I didn't care for it except for one chapter, his chapter on the advantages of the games. I thought that was a brilliant explanation of some psychoanalytic concepts. Mm -hmm. And I still make use of those ideas today. But the book didn't make much sense to me. Then in 1969, I went to a workshop with David Kuffer, who was um, Eric Bird's partner in Carmel. And he put these little circles on the board. And suddenly, so many of the things I've been studying in psychology made sense is I looked at the adult ego and the various child ego states and the various parent ego states and how we were able to talk about internal influence and the child's loyalty to the parent and then doing transactions. Then I think it made sense. Mm. And Byrne had just published his 19, or had published his book 1961 10 years or nine years before. And that book had a big impact on many psychoanalysts. Mm. Uh, by the time Games People Play came out, he spoke to not psychotherapists, but to lay people. And he spoke in such a language that people could identify with the games. Mm. And, and the same thing with his book, What Do You Say After You Say Hello? <laughs> It's a very good book for people to have an understanding of script mm -hmm. and how it fits in their life. So those ways I think we say innovative. And now things like script, games, contracts, mm -hmm. transactions are part of the popular lexicon. Uh, so this is my second question. Eric Byrne built a bridge between psychoanalysis, cognitivism and the humanistic uh, therapies. In your opinion, which part of Bern legacy is still useful for the world of psychotherapy and mental health now? Well, certainly, as I mentioned before, his idea of contracts. Um, and yet, there's a lot of interaction 
over the years between Gestalt therapist and transactional analyst. I began as a Gestalt therapist. Um, and the Gestalt therapist don't believe in contracts at all. Uh, in Gestalt therapy, we would not engage in what is the outcome because it takes away from the excitement mm -hmm. and, and the growth in discovery. But I think Byrne really has influenced the psychotherapy world with contracts. Several of us who were active in the early years of TA, such as Bob Goulding, Finney English, and myself, had trained with Fritz Perls. So we did a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas. Eric Byrne and Fritz Perls were actually friends. And Fritz Perls would go to Byrne's house periodically when he was in California mm -hmm. for dinner. And people like to put them on the program at the same conference and have them debate. So if you attended those programs, you would see them debating each other as to whose approach was best. One of the things I loved about TA when I first came in as a Gestalt therapist, I wasn't a transactional analyst, is how welcomed I was. Um, and at the first TA conference I attended, which wasn't until January of 1972, when I did my clinical certification, uh, I did a presentation on how TA can incorporate affective, cognitive, behavioral, and physiological approaches to psychotherapy. And it was very well received. I remember Steve Cartman coming up to me saying that this was captured what he was hoping TA would be over the next generation. So one of the things that has been beautiful about TA and somewhat of a problem is its willingness to incorporate many, many other ideas. About five years ago, I edited a book on life scripts. Every single chapter presents script from a different perspective. There is no orthodoxy. Two years ago, I did a book called Transactional Analysis of Contemporary Psychotherapy. Again, 12 chapters. Every chapter presents a very different kind of TA. But we're all united together in some common value system, common language, uh, common understanding of things like contracts and script and strokes. Uh, so there is many different kinds of TA and yet we all belong together. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a comprehensiveness uh, to it. Now if I missed part of your question, was there... Sorry? You have, have I answered your question fully? I think yes. Okay. You answered. Okay, thank you for it. Um, with your studies and your clinical experiences, you gave a meaningful contribution in making the script clinically and uh, practically recognizable through the racket system model. Can you say something on this topic? <laughs> Do you have a week? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I'm trying to. A whole week we could talk about it. Um, I would like it. You know, it's hard to summarize. I've been in this profession now, formerly a psychologist, for 50 years. Uh, before that I had four years of work with children. Um, the script is the primary thing that I focus on. what you call the racket system, we, Marilyn Zeltzman and I originally wrote that article. It came out of her being in my Gestalt training program at the time and dis describing what I was doing and she began to show that I was working in a pattern. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, you're always working on rackets. But we got into an argument about what is racket. And so she went home and she gave me one definition of racket. Mm -hmm. And then I would write her another note and tell her, Here, and here's another definition. Mm -hmm. And we found in the CAE literature there were about ten different definitions of rackets. But when you looked at them all together, 
they were a system of beliefs and behaviors and fantasies and reinforcing memories and repressed feelings and that became the racket system article that you know that we published in 1979 Ah, uh, now maybe it was 81. I published another article in 79. This is the other half of the Racket System article called Script Cure. Mm -hmm. And that was 1979. That's the theory behind the Racket System article. Uh, then years later, I published a book chapter entitled The Script System, which is the same as the Racket System, but I was linking it to the concept of script and how script is formed in several ways. Very early in life by physiological survival reactions. That the child has tension, afraid. The, the script is a body experience and an emotional experience. It's not thought about, it's not decisional, but it happens out of neglect and out of trauma. Then you have the child who is consistently disregarded, neglected, criticized, who over time just comes to a conclusion. As one of my clients said, uh, what I said to her, you know, when did you decide that you were of no value? And she looked at me and she said, Richard, I never decided that. In my family, that's reality. I'm a girl. My brothers were valued. I was no value. So I didn't make a script decision. Mm -hmm. So you have those kind of conclusions on top of the physiological survival reactions. And then you have the explicit decisions. These are the ones that our clients can often remember. They say, oh, I remember I was 12 years old. My father disregarded me. I made a decision never to be close to him again. And with that, you could do something like redecision therapy. You can have, take the person back into the actual experience, have them reenact it, and they can make a new decision changing that life script. But when the script is made up of hundreds of little conclusions over and over again, like my client who said, I'm not important. Then we need a relational form of therapy. That's not something we can do quickly, but it's in the quality of how we are as a person with that client. And then when the script is in the body, when it's affective, physiological, often pre-language, or if there was language in the face of trauma, then the script requires a body focus. Either the therapist focusing and bringing the person aware of their body, or maybe actually doing body kind of psychotherapy. Now that's one of the things that TA has often flirted with. Uh, over in the literature, there are people like Joe Cassius or David Steele, um, or Bill Cornell or myself who've written about doing body work in TA. But on the whole, there's not a lot of body work mm -hmm. as part of transactional analysis. It tends still to be mostly cognitive and behavioral. Thank you for your, for your answer, Richard. Um, what are the eight relational needs you refer to when you talk about the patient therapist relationship? Well, <clears throat> there's many more than eight relational needs. Um, these eight came out of a two-year study where we had 16 different therapists inquiring with their clients what was missing in their relationship with family members, with previous therapists, uh, with their co-workers. And we had a whole long list of things that people said. And then we did a factor analysis 
and came up with these eight, which were the most common ones people talked about in therapy. So I hope that your listeners don't think only in terms of eight, but use these eight as a guideline for working with people. The first, and I think in some ways the most important one, is the need for security in the relationship. To be in the presence of someone that you know is not going to hurt you physically, who is not going to humiliate you, or put you down, or demean you in any way. And with that kind of security, there's a freedom to express oneself. The second one that we found was to be in the presence of somebody who provides validation, who sees us as valuable. So if we have a fantasy, they don't just disregard it as a fantasy, but says there's some meaning to that. Who sees our behavior as significant in some context. So that the need for validation is about being significant in the eyes of the other person. The need, so it's a need for validation, for somebody to appreciate who we are in our uniqueness. The third one in our study was the need to be in the presence of somebody who provides protection and guidance, strength, and wisdom. Winnicott said it very well in one of his publications. He said that the client needs to be with somebody who is older and wiser and stronger. And I think we all need that. That's what a little child needs when they hold a parent's hand crossing the street. I think as an old person, we rely on our doctor to have that wisdom. People come to us as psychotherapists, wanting us to be wise. And this, I think, is the client-centered reason for having ethics. That ethics protects the client in that need to have somebody to look up to. Now, many people misidentify that then as idealization. But I think there's a real need to have someone on whom we can take trust and take our strength from. At the same time, we have the need for a shared experience. To have somebody who is going to know our experience because they've been on that same path. It's like the client who's going to want to someday turn to you and say, well, do you know what it's like to have a terrible marriage? Or do you know what it's like to be depressed? Not that they want you to be depressed or have a terrible marriage, but they need to know, have you walked that path that they are on? And is there light at the end of the tunnel? Is there hope for them? And this is why minorities like to be around minorities. They don't have to say much because they understand each other's shared experience. Now this is interesting because this is where there's a split in the psychotherapy literature. Those therapists who focus on the need for a shared experience think that therapy needs to be, you tell me something about you, I'll tell you something about me, and that the therapist needs to do a lot of self-revealing. Those therapists who build their theory around the need for the therapist to be wiser, stronger, more secure, say, no, don't tell your story. Now, which one is the right way? It's not in the theory. It's in according to what the client needs. Does this client need to look up to me to have me strong and, and wise and understanding? Or does this client need to know that I have stumbled, I have fallen, 
I've been down. So it depends on what the client needs. Mm -hmm. Then there's the need for self-definition. This is who I am. This is my uniqueness. This is what I think. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. That's why when we use phenomenological inquiry, it's so powerful because it invites the client with every inquiry to define themselves more and more and more. Then the next need that came up in our study was the need to make an impact. The need to influence the other person. To, when we say no, that they say, okay. Uh, when we express our opinion, that they at least give us consideration. And I think all of us have that need to influence the other. In psychotherapy, I often ask people about, how are you experiencing me? As a way for them to express themselves, self-definition, and to make an impact on me, so that I change in according to understanding how I affect them. Then there's the need to have the other initiate. To have the other person reach out, to ask us questions, to do something for us. Many TA therapists have difficulty with this because they're so worried about rescuing. But you know, there have been times when the most important thing I did in a session is get out of my chair and move over and sit right on the sofa next to the client. They didn't ask for it. I initiated it, but it touched their heart. And the last one that was on our list that we actually discovered later in the process was the need to express love, to express gratitude, appreciation, thankfulness. And I think that's an important need. If you talk to couples whose marriages are in trouble, one of the things one of those people will often tell is that I tried to express my love and it wasn't accepted. I remember once being at a workshop very appreciative of what the therapist had very appreciative of what the therapist had done. And I went over to massage his shoulders and he pushed me away. <laughs> and how how that hurt. Little kids are powerful lovers. Little kids know about expressing love. I mean that's it's amazing to me that kids can be abused and still still love their parents. <coughs> <coughs> so those are the eight relational needs that I teach. I make use of them a lot. But I go beyond that. I ask people in their own language, what do you think you need? What was missing in the relationship? What is anything missing here in our therapy relationship. So it's a constant research going on into each individual's uniqueness. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to say one other thing. When couples come to therapy and he says, she doesn't love me anymore. And she says, he doesn't love me anymore. What are they talking about? Well, if I interview him, he says, <clears throat> she never initiates any affection with me. She's not companionable. She won't go skiing with me. And I turn to her and I say, what's missing? And she says, I don't feel secure. He criticizes me. I used to look up to him, but I don't look up to him anymore. And I... When I try to make an impact, he ignores me. 
So when couples talk about what's not working, they're talking about relational needs not being responded to. Transactional anal analysis is a psychological theory successfully used in the organization, education, and counseling fields. In your opinion, what are the strong points of this attention for the social dimensions? That is a difficult question. Um, so much depends on what you mean by the social field. The thing that comes to mind <clears throat> right now because I'm doing some training of therapists in Turkey who are working with the Syrian refugees. It's about getting them to talk together, um, getting them to communicate their struggle, how they survived. Um, are we using TA directly? No, because we're not focusing on games, we're not using drama triangle. Uh, they have used the concept of ego states <clears throat> and the difference between child ego states, adult and parent ego states. Um, but mostly what we've been doing is group process and a relational group process for those Syrian refugees. Now where they're doing the TA training is with a group of Syrian medical doctors and teaching them about ego states and transactions. Um, so that's a project that I know s something about. Here in Italy you have a lot of projects with immigrants. So I suspect that many of your Italian colleagues are probably far better to answer that question than I am. My work has been primarily in the field of psychotherapy, in individual and group psychotherapy, and I haven't done much in a social field. Mm. I've done some organizational consulting, and there I teach about relational needs, I teach the script system, um, <clears throat> I teach about inquiry, mm. um, only phenomenological inquiry, not historical inquiry because it doesn't belong there, and about the sense of attunement. So those are TA concepts that I've gotten the Eric Byrne Award for that I find very applicable to the business world, to the education world, to those people working in the area of, in, of human trauma, such as the Afghani refugees, the Syrian refugees, the people coming out of Africa, who need a real sense of somebody being tuned in and listening to them and helping them get reorganized in their new world. Uh, yes, Richard, about that. The migratory emergence in Europe and in Italy uh, leads new reflections about the construction of the therapeutic uh, relationship. How transactional analysis uh, could a useful tool to deal with these changes? Well, th that's what I've tried to bring to TA. Um, you know, I, I started before my Gestalt training as a client-centered therapist. Uh, one of the things I most appreciated about my training in client-centered therapy was the sense of unconditional positive regard. That is to really see the person without looking for psychopathology. To see the uniqueness in that person. To see how they have struggled and managed to survive. And to appreciate that struggle with them before we attempt to change their behavior. I'm okay, you're okay. What a wonderful concept of seeing the fact that all people are born equally valuable. That they have a right to their own self-determination. Um, and that's what script th therapy is about. 
helping people arrive at their own self-determination, not being imposed by injunctions or pressure, things that they have to conform to, but to be who they were meant to be. That's what comes to mind now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, this is my last question. Uh, transactional analysis organizations are present uh, all over the world, and uh, transactional an analysis pays special attention to uh, cross-cultural exchanges. You have a broad international view on uh, FEA associations. What are, in your opinion, the benefits of this uh, um, dissemination from New Zealand to United States? and South America? <laughs> well, I have had the honor of working on every single continent in 30-some countries. Mostly what I see is similarity. People are hurt by trauma, mostly by relational trauma. They feel deprived, empty, as a result of neglect. People are anxious about what's going to happen in their life. So the anxiety, the emptiness, the loneliness, the reactions to trauma, they are in every country, in every culture. How people cover that up, how they make themselves invulnerable or put on a facade, that changes from country to country. Mm. I go to one country and people may be very expressive of their emotion. I go to another country and they're very quiet about their emotion. In some countries, somebody, if they don't understand something, they're quick to be angry. Go to another country, they don't understand something, they'll go gossip about it. And it's, so th there's some cultural overlay but I think that's mostly about how to cover up their vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So maybe I just have a, my own view of it, but I think people are almost the same, no matter where we go. Mm, okay, thank you so much for this interview. I was honored to do this interview with you. Uh, I will thank you on behalf of uh, Performat and uh, we hope to see you uh, in uh, other uh, events. So thank you so much, Richard. Oh, thank you. This has been a pleasure to be with you, and I've enjoyed your questions. I hope my answers weren't too detailed. Of course, sure. Uh, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>